All right, last unit of the semester. Aren't you all excited? This is it for the semester. We're halfway through chemistry. Yeah, liquids. Yeah, liquids and solids and solutions. All right, you all can stop talking now. OK, so um, we're going to study this unit probably, not probably. If I had to pick one topic that I felt was the most important thing due to where it, how often it shows up on the AP and how it's inter interwoven in every single topic that we're going to study, that is intermolecular forces. Even when I'm teaching organic now in organic chemistry, I bring intermolecular forces up probably at least twice a week. Like, it is everywhere. It's important. It is such a large component of physical properties, characteristics of all these different molecules. So, sorry, and I meant intermolecular forces, <laughs> not these. Intermolecular forces are within a molecule. So within a molecule, what is the force or what is formed by sharing electrons? What's that called? What's sharing electrons called? A bond. So intermolecular, intramolecular forces are bonds. Intermolecular forces, inter, this is what I was referring to before when I went on my big tirade about how important it is. And that, that's, these are also known as IMFs or Van der Waals forces. Um, I'll go into more detail in a little bit, but in general, there's three types of intermolecular forces that you're responsible for knowing. London dispersion forces are the primary forces that exist in, who remembers, what kind of molecules? Nonpolar. So nonpolar molecules. And by nonpolar, I'm talking about molecules. You'll need to draw Lewis structures to figure out what the molecules are, polarity-wise, in order to then classify their intermolecular force. Dipole-dipole forces and hydrogen bonding both happen between polar molecules. These are the forces that hold the molecules close to each other. If we didn't have intermolecular forces, everything would be gases. So the polar molecules are going to either be dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonding. The only difference here is hydrogen bonding has a very specific criteria. To be hydrogen bound, to have hydrogen bonding intermolecular forces, H needs to be attached to what three elements? Just th yell it out. Not iron and clay. Those are the three strong binary acids. NOF. Yeah, those who had me last year, I say NOF. Or some teachers say it's no FON, F-O-N. NOF or FON. So you have to have hydrogen literally bonded specifically to one of those three things in order for there to be hydrogen bonding. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about them more specifically after we talk about some characteristics of water and liquids and things that you need to remember from Chem 1 that aren't necessarily in the course description for AP, but they, they call it prior knowledge. And so they can throw things at you that, that you like, oh, I didn't know that we had to remember that. And so I'm going to go over that stuff. Um, this picture here is showing water and it's hydrogen bonding. All of this whole hydrogen bonding business and the dipole-dipole business is based on the alignment of the dipole moments. This is why we had you know a dipole moment. All of our electrons are chilling on this side, making this side partially negative and that side partially positive. Because of that, when water is in a solid state, it aligns as indicated, where the negative hydrogen will be attracted to the positive, I mean, sorry, the positive hydrogen will be attracted to a negative oxygen of another molecule. Now, do you see all this space here? Do you kind of see why that has to happen in order for alignment to happen? This is the reason ice is less dense than liquid water. Water is the only substance that solid will actually float in its liquid. If you think about it, if you have any other solid, it's going to fall in its liquid. Any other, lead, I can't even think of any examples. Any other solid in the world, its solid is more, more dense than its liquid. Water, due to the hydrogen bonding and the way it has to align to get as close to each other as it can, that's why we, we, we get that characteristic, all that space. This is a weird bird. Water is definitely special. Um, so 
What's important to know about phase changes, because we're talking about liquids and solids and solutions, is as things change phase, all we're doing is overcoming the intermolecular forces. I can't remember the year, but it broke my soul on the AP when I was grading. The question was true or false, and explain why. When water boils, bonds are broken. So many people said true. What is the answer? False. Do we break bonds? when we boil water. Do we make hydrogen and oxygen? No. When you boil water, all you're doing is overcoming those intermolecular forces. The more energy you put in, the more energy the molecules have so they can separate further, which is overcoming those intermolecular forces. So I don't know what you need to do, circle this, star this, commit it to memory, whatever. When you see a phase change, intermolecular forces are merely overcome. You do not break bonds. To break bonds, you need a lot more energy. You need like electricity or you need some sort of crazy nuclear energy. You need a lot of energy to break bonds. So this in itself is something that students always have misconceptions about. Okay, um, we're going to do a quick little review of some Cur some different types of curves. We're going to look at them for water. Well, this one we'll look at for water. And this is, we call, a heating curve. Do you all remember this from Chem 1? This is not in the AP curriculum, but they had the little caveat at the bottom that says, oh, heating curves are prior knowledge, prior knowledge assumed. So you can still get use of knowing this information. They allude to things with this. So I do want you to, to still know it. Um, your slanted lines means that temperature changes, and the slanted lines are each representing a phase. This is your solid phase, this is your liquid phase, and this is your gaseous phase. The flat lines represent what? The phase change itself, right? Notice that on the flat lines, the temperature isn't changing. So we're adding heat, but the temperature is not changing. Why is that? breaking or overcoming intermolecular forces. The more, when we're adding heat here, all that energy isn't going to change the temperature of the solution. The energy is actually going to the molecules and allowing them to overcome the intermolecular forces. Why is this line here from liquid to solid to liquid so much shorter than the liquid to steam? Okay, I go the other way, well, to melt ice, yeah. If you think about how solids are, it takes a lot less energy to go from er, rigid structure to liquid than to go from liquid to gas, okay? So separating the molecules to that extent takes more energy, so that's a longer line. And it's a longer line for every substance. Every substance has its own heating curve. Um, so here, our melting point, is at zero, and our boiling point's at 100. We know that because it's water. Um, when we do calculations, what you have to do is locate where on this chart we are. Are we just in solid state when we're doing our calcs? If we are, we just use MCAT. On any of the slanted lines, you use MCAT. On the flat lines, we use this heat of fusion and heat of vaporization constant times mass. and if we have multiple steps, we just do them and add them up. Is this ringing a bell? Okay. Um, if you haven't done it, in, have you done it in physics yet? Not yet. Not yet. Um, I know we did it in chemistry. I was just checking if you did it in physics. So when you add them up, any, so say like we're doing ice at, we're melting ice at negative um, 10, and we're melting it to water at 30 degrees we would do Q equals MCAT plus Q equals heat of fusion times mass plus Q equals MCAT. And that's how you would use those. Down here you've got all your specific heats of your different substances. If you are doing substances other than actual um, water, 
they're going to give you melting and boiling points. You're not going to have to memorize any of that. So let's just do a problem here real quick. How much heat energy is required to raise the temperature of 44 grams of lead from room temperature, 21 degrees Celsius, to its melting point? What state of matter is lead at room temperature? Solid. So if we are going from solid to its melting point, we're just there. We're not even getting into, into the, the heat of fusion. We're going to that point, and we're going to stop. So we're only going to have to use Q equals MCAT to solve this. So let's do that. Our mass of lead is, can't find it, 44. Our specific heat of lead, can you all look back and tell me? 0.13 joules per gram degree Celsius. And our delta T, what's our T final? 327 is final, and T initial is 21.0. We're going to get a positive number. Does that make sense? Yeah, because we're putting in energy to make it melt. So that's a Q positive. So to three sig figs, give me your uh, two sig figs. Two sig figs, give me the answer. I should have told you to get your calculators out. One thousand eight hundred joules. Is that is that good? The number? Y'all get more than one person's getting that? Okay. All right, so that was a pretty easy one. This next one's going to be a little more challenging. Um, calculate the energy that must be removed from 25 grams of water at 21 degrees Celsius as it's converted into ice at negative 11. So we're going to go from, what are the phases in this problem? Liquid? Well, I'm just asking, liquid and? solid, right? So because we're doing that, we're focused on this much of the curve. That's a three-step problem. What's the temperature of this value right here? Zero. Um, it says we're converting it to ice at negative 11, so that could be anywhere here. And we're starting out at liquid water. At 21 degrees Celsius, how do we know that's liquid? Well, that's pretty close to room temperature. So the problem is you just kind of have to use some common sense. 25 degrees Celsius is room temperature. 21 is above zero. You know water's liquid at room temperature, right? So it's going to be somewhere in here. So this is 21. So this would be a one, two, three-step problem. So the first step, I'm going to go the direction it's telling us. It's going from there to there just to show you some signage that's going to be happening. So Q is equal to MCAT will be our first step. We're going to do this as our first step. Q, what is the mass of the water? 25. The specific heat of water liquid is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. What's our temperature final for that step? Zero. And our temperature initial? 21. That's degrees Celsius. Okay, so what is my Q total to two sig figs for this step? Negative 2200? Negative 2200 joules. Does negative make sense? Yes. yes, because energy is being removed. So now let's take a look at. Step two. Step two is a heat of fusion. Fusion is the melting. Vaporization would be the other line from liquid to gas. So our step two is uh, Q is equal to the mass, which is 25 grams. What's the heat of fusion of water? 335 what degrees Celsius over... No, wait, 335 joules per gram. My bad. All right. So three sig figs, what is this number? 
So 8,400? Yeah. 8,400 joules. Now, this is where I need you to, to think. And this has shown up. I, I really was a little bit surprised on not this exam that you took yesterday, the previous one. How many of you reported a negative frequency? Do you remember the problem where you had the energy levels and you had to draw the arrow? And then you were to take that energy and calculate frequency? Why was the energy negative? Because the electron was falling, so energy was negative, right? Those of you who gave a negative frequency, you weren't thinking. You went, you plugged it in, and you solved. You can't have a negative frequency. There is no such thing. So with that, you needed to just plug in E equals HV, plug in that energy as a, as a positive number. Because that's looking at energy, the quantity, not direction of flow. All right? So we have an issue here. What's our issue here? It's, it's, this says it's positive, right? But remember, this is just the quantity required to melt that much stuff. We're removing that, so we have to make this negative. And this is why when I say you guys need to think, you need to think through your problems. You can't be a robot and not think through it, because you, if you just do that, you're going to get the wrong answer, because you're going to totally calculate, add a positive to that instead of a negative. All right, and our third and final step, Q is equal to M cat. So M is 25 still. What's C of solid water? 2.03 joules per gram degree Celsius, and I ran out of room. What's our final temperature? Negative 11 minus 0. Our initial temperature of that step is 0, because again, we're going this direction. And so we should get a negative value here, no problem, to 2 sig figs. Negative what? Negative 560 joules. So how do I find the total amount of heat released? Yep, go ahead and do that to two sig figs. So basically, you take the heat of fusion or heat of vaporization equation sign and match that sign to whatever MCAT's giving you. Negative 11,000 yep. joules. OK, so that's just a quick little review. We're not, you're not going to see a lot of these problems. I just wanted to remind you of its existence and make sure you kind of have a working knowledge of heating curves. Okay. Another type of graph that you need to have a working knowledge of is our phase diagrams, better known in Dima's world, and I'm sure other teachers are saying it, butt diagrams. All right, this is the butt. Do you see the butt? This is the butt. This is the butt crack here. Okay. This, the left cheek is solid. The right cheek is liquid. And what comes out of the butt? Gas. So we should probably call it the fart diagram. Okay. So that was the grossness for the day. So I just want you to understand, remember that every substance has its own phase diagram, and it's basically plotting the combination of every pressure and temperature possible and what the phase would be at that combination of temperature and pressure. So if I'm at the co this combination of temperature and pressure, I'm going to be a solid, right? Anything on the lines is an equilibrium. So if I'm on the line here, that means I have the existence of both solid and gas. This thing called the triple point, what is that the existence of? All three. And there's only one temperature pressure combination for any substance that will give you all three phases. It's pretty cool. Um, up here is called the critical point. Beyond this point, you're always gaseous. And the only other thing I just want you to, to try to remember, notice this is a positive slope. The butt crack is positive. This is not water. Water's butt crack is negative. And what that what that does is it's, it's this characteristic that 
coincides with the idea of water liquid being more dense than water solid. So if you think about, if you have solid, and you increase the pressure on a solid, uh, you're going to make it more solid, right? It's going to stay solid. And that's what normal substances do. If I increase the pressure on the solid anywhere on the curve, it's going to stay solid. But when you have water, water having a negative butt crack, if I increase the pressure on a solid water, bink, it'll go to liquid. Urgh. This is why how we can ice skate. When you ice skate, you don't ice skate on, on ice. You ice skate on water. The blades create a high amount of pressure, so you actually skate on water, and then as you skate off, the pressure decreases and it re-solidifies. I mean, so you feel the difference between when you're on ice in ice skates versus regular shoes, right? When you're in regular shoes, you're, you're skating on ice. When you're in ice skates, you're skating on water. It's an interesting concept. Again, that's all because water's wacky. It's got that negative butt crack. It's got a less dense solid than liquid. So you all feel pretty comfortable being, having some knowledge about phase diagrams. Okay. Now let's get into the meat of what today is about. This is the point of today's lecture, and that's to talk about the different kinds of intermolecular forces and why they exist. So I like to start with the weakest intermolecular force first. It's called London dispersion forces. This is an instantaneous dipole that occurs pretty much accidentally in an atom as it's moving. As these atoms move or molecules move, they bump into things. And as they bump into things, the electron cloud shifts. At the moment an electron cloud shifts, you have what we call an instantaneous dipole. So if my electron cloud normally looks like that, eh, whatever. But if it bumps into something and I all of a sudden have an electron cloud that looks like this, this side then is more negative than this side. So for just a brief moment in time, this will now be attracted as if it was a dipole. This positive will be attracted to this other molecule's negative, and this negative will be attracted to another molecule's positive side. And it continues because these molecules continue to be in motion and continue to bump into each other. Okay? So, this is very significant in large atoms or molecules because large atoms or molecules have lots of what? Electrons. Their clouds are more squishy. The term I want you to use when you talk about this is polarizable. The more electrons you have, the more polarizable the cloud is. So you're going to have a stronger attraction. The more electrons you have, you're going to have a stronger intermolecular force. Please don't say when a molecule is bigger, there's a stronger intermolecular force. They're not going to take that. They want you to say more electrons means you have a stronger intermolecular force. If you want to really look like a badass, say it's more polarizable. Cloud is more polarizable. It's just squishier. All right? So the one thing that I, I want to just mention, but I don't want you to go crazy with this concept, this actually occurs in all molecules. Polar, nonpolar, doesn't matter, because all those molecules are bumping into each other. However, it is not the primary intermolecular force in polar molecules. The others are. So you don't have to mention this. And I actually prefer kind of you don't mention it because I don't want you to think it's significant. It's not significant in polar molecules. It's there, but it's not significant. It's significant in nonpolar molecules because that's the only intermolecular force it has. This is the only intermolecular force in nonpolar molecules. So although water has London dispersion forces, its primary strength of intermolecular force comes from hydrogen bonding. Okay? Now let me ask you this. This is always an interesting question. Chlorine versus bromine versus iodine. What kind of molecules are all of those? Huh? Nonpolar, right? Those are all nonpolar. Awesome. So they all have intermolecular force of? London dispersion. 
But look at the periodic table. Chlorine is red. It's a gas at room temperature. Bromine is blue. It's a liquid at room temperature. Iodine is a solid at room temperature. Why do they have different intermolecular forces? Solids are going to have stronger intermolecular forces than, than, than gases. Why do they have different intermolecular forces if they're all nonpolar? Beautiful. The bigger the molecules get, the more electrons they have. Got to mention the electrons. The more polarizable the cloud is. So iodine is huge. So it's going to have a bigger shift in that electron cloud, causing a stronger intermolecular force, allowing it to be solid at room temperature. Okay? So if you're comparing strengths of intermolecular forces between things that are nonpolar, the strength is based on the number of electrons. If you're comparing between polar and nonpolar, well, the polar intermolecular force is usually, usually stronger than, than any London dispersion. However, if you have a teeny, teeny polar molecule and a really big, huge nonpolar molecule, sometimes this is stronger. And so that's one of those exceptions. They'll say, hey, xenon has, not xenon, they'll say, oh, iodine has an intermolecular force that is much higher than HF. Why is that? And you'll be like, damn, HF is hydrogen bonding. Isn't that strong? I thought that was stronger. So what would be the reason? It's got a huge electron cloud, so that polarizability is, is bigger than the polarity of just that tiny little molecule. Now, I just made that up. I don't necessarily know if that particular example is true or not, but those are the kinds of exceptions you might run into. Okay. So let's look at the next one. This one is super simple, dipole forces. Um, dipole moment and hydrogen bonding are exactly the same thing. Both of these exist because of the dipole moment that already exists in the molecule. So if we have HCl, we know that this is a polar molecule, right? We know the dipole moment goes this way, making this side partially negative and this side partially positive. Because those dipoles exist, it is going to then be attracted to another HCl, where the positive of this HCl is going to be attracted to the negative of the other HCl. That's where the term dipole, dipole comes from. The dipole of one molecule is attracted to the dipole of another molecule. Got it? Hydrogen bonding, exact same thing. It's not dipole-dipole, though, because some random fool decided, first off, to randomly assign nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine's cutoff for that, and then to also call it bonding, which throws off the majority of the nation. They think it's a bond. It's not a bond. It's still an electrostatic attraction. But it's based on the dipole of the molecule. So the attraction of this dipole is still attracted to the dipole of the other one. But because it's oxygen attached to a hydrogen, it puts it in the hydrogen bonding category. Yes, JD? Somebody arbitrarily did a cutoff, like a difference in electronegativities between NO and F with H meets a certain criteria, it certainly is high enough. So we're just going to categorize it that. That's literally the only thing. Okay? It's significantly stronger than most others. Okay, so these are just some pictures. I think the poll goal that you're going to be doing and turning in is going to be really helpful here. Um, if you, I, I encourage you to read these little things. And then this is just a little diagram showing you melting and boiling. I need you to understand there's a relationship between boiling and melting points and intermolecular forces. So the higher the melting point, is the intermolecular force stronger or weaker? Stronger, okay? The higher the boiling point, the higher the intermolecular force. So that's important for you to understand that. So here it shows you this is methane. We know methane looks like this. What type of molecule is methane? It's nonpolar, right? It's got a super low boiling point. But if you look at good old water up here, we know water, hydrogen bonding, going to have a lot higher boiling point. And all of these are hydrogen bonding. And we're not going to go in. I don't expect you to differentiate 
why is this water bigger than whatever? That's not necessarily a comparison you'll ever have to do. Okay? So dipole dipole stuff would fall in here. Okay, I really like these questions on this page. Which molecule is capable of forming stronger intermolecular forces? N2 or H2O? Just like last unit, when you need to do intermolecular forces, like you did hybridization, like you did structure, what did you have to do? Draw a Lewis dot. Got to have your Lewis dot. Well, this one isn't as hard as others that you may run into. All right. Which is going to have stronger intermolecular forces? Water, because what's its intermolecular force? Hydrogen bonding. And a little bit of London dispersion, but hydrogen bonding. And this guy is just it's nonpolar, so it's London dispersion. Draw two Lewis structures for the formula C2H6O and compare the boiling points. So I'm going to start with the easy structure first. I'm going to do my chain. And I have to put seven things on here. Any ideas of what I can do? I'm going to put five H's first. Any ideas? How about an OH group? Good. What's this group called? Hydroxyl group makes this kind of compound a what? This is an alcohol. All right. So that's one way you can draw this. We want to draw a structural isomer for this in a different arrangement. Does anybody remember ketones? Or ethers? Not ketone. Ketone won't work. That's wrong. But an ether would work. Remember the ether? Ether bunny? Does anybody remember? It? It's the O's in the middle. So we can draw this. This would also be an isomer. And this is an ether. Bink, bink. Two structures with substances with the exact same formula. C2H6O, incredibly different. Take a look at this alcohol. What kind of intermolecular force is in this one? First off, is that, that polar or nonpolar, that molecule? Polar. Why is it polar? Yeah, this oxygen is very electronegative, so the dipole moments go in that direction. Electrons are not symmetrically or, um, around the molecule. They're being kind of pulled toward that oxygen. So it's definitely a polar molecule. So if it's a polar molecule, it could be dipole, dipole, or hydrogen bonding. Which one is it? Hydrogen bonding because of this. So that's super, super strong intermolecular force. Most alcohols are what phase at, what, what state of matter at room temperature? Liquids. You guys don't know anything about alcohol, as it should be. But whatever. Anyway, this is liquid at room temperature. It's got a pretty good intermolecular force, okay? keeping it liquid. This is an ether. You've heard about ethers. Where do they use ethers? Smelling salts. So that means they're very, they vaporize very easily. So they're usually ethers. I can't keep an ether in this, this lab to kill me. Like, I try to save it so I can use it for different experiments, but it vaporizes so quickly. It's much more comfortably a gas. That's because it's got very little intermolecular force. Look at this molecule. Is this polar or nonpolar? Here we have a nonpolar molecule because we've got an even this, yeah, oxygen is more electronegative, but our dipole is going, er, er, so we have an even distribution of electrons throughout the whole molecule. This is nonpolar, so it's London dispersion forces. Okay. And then I love this question. Talk about crossing our, our different content areas. Now we actually can talk about intermolecular forces a little more clearly. Which gas would behave more ideally at the same conditions? What were the two things we need for an ideal gas, the two variables we looked at? Low attraction and small. Well, if you look at these guys, CO is triple bonded. And it looks like this. N2 is also triple bonded. And they're not significantly different in size. Right? They're pretty much the same molar mass. So small is not going to be something, which one's smaller, more, more ideal. Ideality will not be based on the size. 
What's dictating is the attraction. So which one would be more ideal? Yep, the N2, because this is London dispersion forces. Since it has little attraction, remember, it's not going to lower the pressure of the container. Do you all remember that? If you have a lot of attraction, the molecules will, will be more attracted to each other, so the overall pressure will be lower than it should be. Remember that ideal Van der Waals equation? That's where this is coming from. So this has an LDF, so this is going to be more ideal because it's got a lower attraction. Okay. And even though, and this is polar, what's the, just for grins, what's the IMF for this? Dipole, dipole. Okay. Last thing, we're going to go through these real quick. You might need to draw your Lewis structures, you might not. A, CH3OH, that's an alcohol. Polar and nonpolar. Polar, and what's the intermolecular force? Hydrogen bonding. Anytime you see an alcohol, folks, it's hydrogen bonding. If you have a, hydrox a hydroxide on it, like that, hydroxyl. In a molecular compound, not in an ionic hydroxide situation, not sodium hydroxide. Different, different story. Talking about as a, as a hydroxyl functional group of all nonmetals. Xe, we didn't talk about lone atoms. Xe is fat. Nonpolar, lots of electrons. So the LDS is great because the cloud is fat, so the cloud is more polarizable. So this is nonpolar LDS. H2S. Okay, this whole, oh, that seems pretty polar. What, what do we need to know? We need the Lewis dot. And if you were to draw the Lewis dot, you would see this. What is this? Polar or nonpolar? Polar, so this is hydrogen bonding? No, dipole, dipole. Dip, dip. CLF, don't need to draw that one. What is that? Do we understand we don't need to draw that? It's two different things attached, it's polar, right? So it is dip, dip. Now, the last one is kind of a trick, and it's not really a trick, but I need you to pay attention. What is CaNO3? What type of compound is that? That's an ionic substance, right? These are all molecular substances. These are all molecules. This is not a molecule, so it can't have an intermolecular force. So what is the thing, what is that energy called holding the sucker together? The, yeah, but what's that called? What's the type of energy? Lattice energy. So this is being held together by lattice energy. So we do not apply intermolecular forces to anything that's ionic because they're crystals. They're held together by a totally different, in a totally different format. All right. We're about to talk about the final. This is the end of the lecture.